1984 is a remarkable book as much of it has come true. Seems that those in power in many places around the world are using 1984 not as a warning, but as a manual. Here is how you control people. Here is how you change the narrative. Here is how you distract the population from the truth. And considering it was written in 1949, Orwell has come up with a pretty incredible vision of our world. What we're going to do in this video is go through part one of the novel, looking at how various experiences and important ideas are represented and how Orwell challenges us to engage with the issues that he explores. We'll do that uh, through chapter one through to chapter four today. So chapter one opens with this quote, it was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. Straight away we understand that we're somewhere else, somewhere not entirely here. Clocks don't strike 13, so with that single word 13, Orwell is throwing us into a new reality. One of the things that science fiction or speculative fiction, dystopian fiction does so well is that it allows us to confront our present reality by examining someone else's. It's a less confronting way of dealing with issues in our own society than dealing with them head on. It allows an author to come from the side and through symbol and metaphor and parallel, lull you into a false sense of security before sucker punching you with the understanding that this book is actually really talking about the world that we live in. So in this way, fiction deals with human experiences. All fiction allows us to examine ourselves, examine our reality, examine the way that we see the world in order to come to hopefully to a deeper understanding of the people and the places and the ideas around us. The rest of the opening in chapter one deals with setting up our sense of place. Uh, it says the hallway smelled of boiled cabbage and old rag mats, for example. And the picture of Big Brother, that's too large for indoor display, uh, says it was an enormous face of a man of about 45 with heavy black moustache and ruggedly handsome features. This is reflective of images of Stalin, for example, who was a significant political figure and who Orwell is critiquing here through his representation of Big Brother. He's grounding it very much in history, in reality. We then move to a description of Winston almost as a contrast. He's a smallish, frail figure, the meagerness of his body merely emphasised by the blue overalls which were the uniform of the party. His hair was very fair, his face naturally sanguine, skin roughened by coarse soap and blunt razor blades and the cold of the winter that had just ended. Winston is not a healthy man, he's meagre, he's frail, his skin is rough, he's not your usual hero, but importantly he's wearing the uniform of the party. Normally, you would think that if someone was a member of whatever the ruling party is, they would be healthy, they might be well fed. Those that are part of a special group in society should be better off if they're more powerful. But Orwell makes clear here that being a part of the party is not necessarily a good thing. Um, and Winston is operating here as a metonymy for the broader society. He's sick, he's frail, and so is everything. All of Airstrip 1 is sick, Oceania, the system is sick. And this is reflective in the description of Winston. So in terms of our understanding of human experiences in this book, it helps us to understand that the characters and characterization are representative of broader human experiences. It seems obvious to say, but the way that characters are presented can potentially help us to see ourselves in them, or see people we know in them, or they could be so foreign to us that they open up entirely new perspectives on the world. Orwell here is opening our perspective up to see the life of someone living under totalitarian rule. It's not a happy place, it's not a healthy place, it's not a thriving place. Let's skip ahead a little bit because this overview isn't meant to replace you independently reading and engaging with and thinking about the text. It's more just to point out where you're going, so it's not going to be completely comprehensive, but it's going to help hopefully uh, some important moments shape and direct your thinking. Further on in chapter one, we see on the side of the Ministry of Truth building, the three slogans of the party. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And these three phrases are all paradoxes and they point to a broader truth at work within Inksoc. The idea that for Inksoc to function properly, the people need to be comfortable living with what we call cognitive dissonance. The idea that the beliefs and the reality that they live in are fundamentally at odds and they need to be okay with that. The three slogans of the party are established as the foundation of the society, the foundation of this political system, and the acceptance of the party's truth needs to override the bounds of basic logic in order to work. Wonder if there are places within our society where people do that. 
probably to an extent. I think we all probably live with a level of cognitive dissonance where the world doesn't quite line up with our expectations or understanding of what should be versus the way that the world is, what is right and wrong and what should be happening. And Orwell is quite directly critiquing the structures and the belief systems that ultimately don't address the nature of reality but rely on manipulation of truth. He then doubles down on this cognitive dissonance because we find out very quickly that the Ministry of Truth is all about changing the truth, that the Ministry of Peace is focused on war, and the Ministry of Love is, and I quote, the really frightening one. When Winston sits down to write in his small but incredibly significant act of rebellion, he very quickly ends up writing this one long run on sentence where he describes the ship full of refugees being bombed in the Mediterranean. Somewhat disturbingly, he describes the, the wonderful shot of a child's arm going up, 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 right up into the air, the audience laughing as a man is shot by a helicopter, the terrific flash of a 20 kilo bomb. And this sudden burst of graphic violence in the novel is confronting, but it's even more confronting when juxtaposed with the descriptions of laughter, how wonderful this all is. The most unpleasant part for me is the three-year-old boy in the audience screaming and hiding his head at this thing, perhaps because he's young enough not to be desensitized to the violence that everyone else seems to think is amazing. But this long run on sentence is overwhelming and it's designed to be overwhelming because Winston is overwhelmed. He doesn't know why yet, but he has to write this down. He's been bottling this stuff up inside him and it has to come out. He doesn't understand what makes him pour out this stream of what he calls rubbish. But something about that whole experience that he had watching this film has prompted him to begin this rebellion, even though he doesn't quite realise why. Orwell here is exploring the power of the media to desensitise us to violence, to brainwash the population through propaganda and this kind of encouragement of a twisted hedonism. Later on still in chapter one, Winston attends the two minutes hate, which of course is compulsory, but also something that people seem to enjoy. Up on screen, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, quote, the enemy of the people appears. And it's important how Orwell describes Goldstein. He says, a lean Jewish face with a great fuzzy aureole of long white hair and a small goatee beard, a clever face and yet somehow inherently despicable. So the party has represented Goldstein in a deliberate way. He's presented as someone to hate. Is presented as an enemy because when you give people a common enemy, when you give people somebody to hate, it galvanizes them as a group. It prevents them from hating you. As long as the people hate Goldstein, they won't blame Big Brother for their problems. Orwell also uses the word Jewish here to echo the way that Hitler gathered people around a common manufactured enemy. He created a group of people to blame for the problems they were having and then galvanized public opinion in order to further his own control methodology. Uh, it's a very similar tactic used today in parts of the world where you construct an enemy, you construct a faceless threat that is coming for you in order to make people afraid, then you promise to keep them safe from these terrible faceless threats. It's this idea of what we call othering, of defining a person as different from and therefore less than you, creating a them so that we can reinforce an us versus them mentality. In chapter two, Winston spends some time with the Parsons family and reflects on the way in which children have been used to surveil their parents, because if you can destroy the trust that exists within a family, you can prevent any inconvenient loving relationships forming that would distract from the loyalty to the party and the love for Big Brother. You can also then create a network of spies that are present in every family and are potentially even more effective than the telescreens, which we haven't discussed yet, but we'll go into a little bit later. At the end of the chapter, Winston writes again. He writes, quote, to the future or to the past, to a time when thought is free, when men are different from one another and do not live alone, to a time when truth exists and what is done cannot be undone. In a sense, then, he's writing to us and Orwell's very gently breaking the fourth wall here to invite us into Winston's world, into his rebellion. The end of this chapter has this little uptick into hope because Winston is writing maybe to a future which is better than this one. Perhaps one day Big Brother will fall and he writes to that time, but potentially also he's writing to the past. This recognition that this is not the way things have always been. 
Now this in itself is a thought crime because the power of Big Brother lies in the people believing Big Brother's immortality, his permanence. And so Winston challenges that, but this moment of hope is very quickly undone because just a few lines later, Winston realizes that he's already dead. He writes, quote, a thought crime does not entail death, thought crime is death. And this isn't a metaphor in this case, but simply a cold fact of his reality. Then in chapter three, Winston reflects on the nature of history. He dreams first of his mother, and then we realize that he has difficulty recalling the details of his childhood. This leads him into a further reflection that it's impossible to remember who, or who Oceania was ever at war with. Oceania is at war with Eurasia and in alliance with East Asia, and the party claims that this is the way it's always been. Winston knows that it's actually only been four years since this alliance was reversed, but the party claims otherwise because, quote, the enemy of the moment always represented absolute evil, and it followed that any past or future agreement with him was impossible. Winston realizes that perhaps the most frightening thing about this statement is that it might be true. The party could, quote, thrust its hand into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened. Who controls the past says the party controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past. So history tends to be written by the victors, and so the victors then control the narrative of that victory. We like to think historical records are subjective and unbiased, but there is truth in that if you can alter the record of the past, you can control what happens in the future. This alteration of history is explored more in chapter four as we get a closer look at Winston's work altering the historical record in order to reflect the lie that party wants to push it at any moment. His job is the original pusher of fake news, if you want to think about it that way. Other branches of the Ministry of Truth supply newspapers, films, textbooks, telescreen programs, plays, novels, and again at a lower level for the benefit of the proletariat, uh, garbage newspapers containing nothing but straw, sport, crime, and astrology, bad novels, films filled with sex, automatically written songs using a machine. The idea behind the lower level is to keep the proles happy and ignorant, to distract them with this meaningless, all-absorbing rubbish so they have no time to contemplate important things like how much the party is giving them a raw deal. That becomes more important later as Winston reflects on the potential power of the proles, but let's leave it there for the moment at the end of chapter four and see where things go at the end of part two.